Good afternoon. Well, first and foremost, I want to tell you that I am very pleased and happy uh, to be with you and to share uh, some thoughts uh, with you. Uh, maybe uh, it is useful that I start by introducing transform because this is not only a question of politeness but also uh, would give you a bit of the background uh, before which uh, I will tackle the issue. Uh, transform is a network consisting of 22 uh, research and educational uh, organizations, all of them belonging to the left. Uh, at the same time, uh, it's um, the political foundation of the European Left Party. A political foundation means that a um, couple of years ago, the uh, parties, the political parties in the European Parliament were invited by the presidency of the Parliament uh, to create research organizations on European level. The idea was to give the parties first and foremost, uh, um, a space of reflection, and secondly, uh, uh, instruments in which they can gather their uh, people and their audiences in order to include them in a political process on the European level. Uh, the European Left Party, itself a party of uh, 38 left parties and the major political force of the radical left in Europe, uh, decided not to create an own structure, a new institution with a president, a director, and so on and so forth. They decided, uh, and I think politically rightly, uh, to uh, ask us as a network uh, to exercise this function, the political uh, foundation of the European Left Party, which we accepted. And I say this because I want to, to um, show that uh, Transform is somehow a space which consciously and deliberately and with conviction belongs to the European Left Party. And at the same time, it consists of different forces, and some of them do not belong to a party which is close to the European Left Party, so it's an autonomous space. And this is important when it comes to research, because research, which is more or less fulfilling that what a political entity wants to do, is uh, not a very efficient and good research work. And at the same time, we understand ourselves as a link uh, between uh, the European Left Party, the political actors uh, on the European uh, scale, and the trade unions and the social movements uh, in Europe. Um, in this sense, we dedicate a big deal uh, of our efforts uh, to develop now what we call a common European front against uh, the austerity policies and the authoritarian centralist turn in the European uh, Union. Um, if you look back to the last 24 months, you could easily conclude that maybe historians of the labor movement uh, in 50 years will see it this way, that uh, we experienced a period of huge mass mobilizations of the labor movement, and not only of the labor movement, also, also of uh, precarious people, of youth mobilizations, and so on and so forth. But, and this is uh, a big reservation, um, all these strikes, general strikes, mass rallies, uh, firstly, they are not really known in Europe. Who knows, by example, that last weekend 150,000 Czechs showed in the streets in order to confront a corrupt government. Uh, and secondly, even if they were known, uh, it is not deniable that so far they did not have changed anything in the general course of development. They are expressions of outrage, of anger, of resistance, but they are not able to propose a coherent strategic answer, 
and they are not able to change the relation of power in Europe. Relation of power in Europe, uh, two years ago, transformed state, state uh, a seminar entitled Why does the crisis favor the right rather than it favors the left? And this reflected the fact that um, in a whole bunch of public elections which took place within the last five, six years, conservative parties were prevailing. And besides the conservative parties, uh, a new element in the uh, political geography of Europe came up, namely xenophobic, nationalistic, extreme right. So you had a situation in which the first reaction uh, of big parts of the populations towards the crisis were conservative, uh, were even uh, reactionary. Somehow you can say that uh, within the last couple of months the picture has changed. In, in most of the, of the uh, elections we had uh, in 2012 you can say that uh, the left the uh, left of the left could gain ground. For example, three weeks ago there were elections uh, in Andalusia, which is a uh, Spanish region with 8.5 million inhabitants, where the Izquierda Unida doubled to uh, almost 14 percent. The um, turnout of Jean-Luc Mélenchon at uh, the first round of the presidential elections was somehow disappointing because the expectations were exaggerated, but 11, almost 12 percent in comparison to um, the turnout of Marie-Georges Buffet uh, in uh, 2003 makes, uh, in, in 2007, <coughs> sorry, makes of course a difference. <coughs> and you can take the example of, of, of Denmark, uh, you can uh, look at the polls which predict uh, uh, a rather um, uh, exciting electoral uh, success of the three major forces of the Greek left in the elections next week. But again, you have to ask yourself, well, you have now better turnouts. At the same time, uh, you see again the extreme and uh, nationalist right coming out uh, with more strength of the elections. And thirdly, what is the result of all this? So far, no, no change in European policies was achieved. And this uh, justifies, or this deserves, or this requires, this requires deep reflection uh, about the situation in which we are in. And this is one of the uh, research focuses, and not only research focuses, but also practical uh, attempts uh, of transform. Well, uh, regarding the historical moment, uh, most of the serious observers hold uh, that the European crisis has not come to an end, even worse. Um, there is a certain probability that the worse lies not behind us, but in front of us. This has to do uh, with um, objective economic uh, developments. Uh, the uh, fundamental causes for the crisis, namely the overaccumulation of capital and uh, the imbalances in the current accounts between uh, member states of the European Union still persist. Moreover, the fiscal pact, which was um, decided uh, last uh, month by the head of states of the European uh, Union, uh, aimed uh, at a sustained cementation yeah. of austerity policies yeah. and is accompanied by an authoritarian and central turn of the European yeah. Union, meaning giving the right to the European Commission and the European uh, um, Central Bank to interfere directly into uh, the budget, deciding a process of the member states, um, jeopardizing member states which do not apply the so-called golden rule, namely 
um, uh, certain uh, provisions uh, regarding uh, the limits of uh, annual public deficits, jeopardizing them uh, with severe uh, punishment, and all in all shifting uh, the relation of, of power towards uh, the top, towards a very small circle of non-accountable persons. Uh, I'm always amazed that when people talk about the European Union, they complain um, upon uh, the lack, let's say, of um, effective rights of the European Parliament uh, when it comes to deciding uh, the annual budget of the European Union. Well, indeed, the European Parliament lacks um, original rights of, uh, of genuine Parliament. But at the same time, the European Stability Mechanism provides uh, 950 billion euro to a board of uh, officials which never were elected by anybody and comparing uh, the uh, budget of the European uh, Parliament with this 900 uh, billion euro you come to the conclusion that the uh, budget of the European Union is only a small, a very little proportion of this. So while the public is discussing uh, about the budget of the European Parliament uh, the head of states decided to um, more or less give away 950 billion uh, euro to a board of, um, uh, of officials who do not underlie national leg legislation nor are they accountable to the European Parliament or the European Court of Justice and even they are relieved from any uh, um, legal obligations towards penal penalty law <coughs> So this is a completely, it is a space completely out of any control, and this is what European policies today is about. And although this is a new quality of centralization of power, it is not plausible that this means uh, will allow the European Union and the member states uh, of the European Union uh, to tackle uh, or to cope sufficiently with the challenge uh, posed by uh, the crisis. Under these preconditions, a renewed outbreak of the European debt and banking crisis within the foreseeable future is not unlikely. Probable consequences, and this is the hypothesis of that uh, what I uh, will submit to our debate, would be a more or less voluntary departure of several single states from the monetary union, which is, however, not first and foremost an economic, but primarily a political question. <coughs> and, this, uh, and this in both uh, directions. Uh, politically, in the sense that a political decision will be taken, there is no um, objective necessity uh, that uh, even a country which defaults would get out of the European Union. It will be a political decision, but more seriously than the fact that all this is decided politically is <coughs> that if it takes place, the political consequences were much more serious than the economic consequences were. Because economically, you can say, well, the European Union has now 11 currencies, the euro and 10 other ones, and in case Greek left the uh, euro, then it will be 12, and if Portugal left as well, then it will be 13, and so on and so forth. Not a big deal, in <coughs> fact, economically, all the more that uh, the common market, the single market, will persist. The question is, what does it mean politically if the European <laughs> Union decides that one of the member states may default and they may then do whatever they want, the European Union and the member states won't care anymore. <coughs> this would be a new quality in um, uh, European post-war uh, history. And it is exactly this political situation in which the nationalist, xenophobic and authoritarian right-wing forces could begin to transgress the roles they have thus played. 
Um, but before uh, going now in uh, some of uh, these uh, political reflections, I want to uh, say a couple of words uh, regarding the quality and the character of the crisis. Uh, my point of departure, and this is of course not my personal point of departure, most uh, of economists and uh, social and political scientists uh, join uh, this view, is that the present crisis of capitalism encompasses all its uh, elements. It's uh, a general crisis of the system, a systemic crisis. And only to mention a few of them, it concerns the distribution of work, income, and force between <coughs> the present centers of powers and of wealth and the zones um, of deprivation and neocolonial neo exploitation on the other side. Uh, it's not usual that when talking about the crisis that you start with this aspect, but this is the objective backdrop of the problem because it's evident we live in an era of tremendous upheavals, uh, dramatic change of worldwide power, economic, political, military power, and the question which is raised by the crisis uh, is uh, to which expense, to which expenses uh, the accommodations to these new realities uh, would go. <coughs> For example, if um, the Eurozone countries applied uh, last week to the IMF to enhance uh, its capability to interfere in economic affairs, and the government of Brazil says, well, we will consider it positively, but uh, we uh, request from you uh, that you make this and this and these changes, uh, this shows how even in the IMF where uh, the voting right is weighed by the economic power of, uh, of the different countries have changed within uh, just a, a couple uh, of years. And we will see this uh, development become even stronger uh, within the nearer future and this creates a backdrop of everything which now is decided on the European level. Then uh, the second uh, aspect of this uh, general uh, backdrop concerns the uh, relationship of capitalist methods of production and natural environment. Then the relationship between genders uh, and generations is changing, is changing. And this, of course, modifies the whole mode of reproduction of capitalist societies. Uh, Fourthly, uh, the structural uh, contradictions within the economic uh, capitalist system and particular within uh, its centers, the US, Western uh, Europe uh, and Japan. I referred to this aspect of the problem already by saying uh, that in its essence, uh, the crisis which now is uh, so strong affecting Europe is Firstly, a crisis of overaccumulation of capital. You only can understand the financiarization, financialization in French it's finance, it's other, the financialization uh, of um, um, present day capitalism if you consider uh, the excess of uh, capital uh, available, which um, requests for uh, investment. <coughs> and then if uh, if you consider this, you have to add the aspect of the uh, different um, uh, growth models within the European Union due to uh, different uh, <laughs> scales and levels of uh, productivity, in particular between uh, the export-oriented economies in the European uh, North and the capital-importing uh, economies uh, in the uh, European South. And last, and not uh, least, uh, we uh, are confronted with a crisis of politics, with a crisis uh, of uh, state integration, with, with a crisis of capitalist integration, 
and especially uh, in uh, Europe. Uh, regarding transformation of the international relations. After a long period of dominance of powerful states of the capitalist north over the largest part of the south, which has led to an unbearable imbalance of dis in distribution in income and wealth, a group of emerging countries is today in a process of changing uh, the power relations. And in spite of these billions of people continue to live in bitter destitution. They suffer from a lack of food, <coughs> drinking water, and um, elementary uh, health care. And that means that uh, this, distribution, uh, th this imbalance in distribution is not only a question of social imbalances, but it also contains a growing uh, military uh, uh, risk and a growing uh, risk in uh, uh, security relations. We have today, by the way, in Vienna, uh, a conference of the International Atomic Energy uh, Agency, uh, which actually has to deal with uh, a simple and non-deniable fact, namely that the monopoly of the uh, most powerful uh, imperialist states, the monopoly of uh, weapons of nuclear mass destructions will not survive the next five or ten years. And uh, the special risk which come out of this has of course to do with the fact that the non-proliferation treaty from the 60s never was respected by the powerful <coughs> capitalist countries. So in, in this situation, uh, you will see if uh, there is no agreement on a, a global uh, disarmament, uh, referring to the <coughs> most dangerous nuclear weapons, you will see an uncontrollable proliferation of nuclear powers within uh, two dozens um, of national uh, countries, which would actually uh, change uh, the, complete, the, the complete picture of the security policy geography uh, worldwide. Uh, but I will not uh, dwell now into this question uh, which uh, refer to the international relation of power and the objective uh, limits of uh, capitalist uh, growth. I will uh, say a couple of words um, uh, related uh, to the crisis uh, of uh, state uh, budgets within the European Union, which for the moment seems to be uh, one of the uh, most urgent uh, aspects and, and, and currents of the crisis. Uh, in 2007-2008, uh, the threat of an instantaneous collapse of the neoliberal financial system was averted uh, by billions of euros from state budgets, which have then subsequently uh, transferred uh, the crisis of financial capitalism into a crisis uh, of uh, public debt. Uh, large deficits uh, of the uh, national, um, national states and uh, the sovereign deficits, deficits became then targets of international speculations and the rating agencies. Just to, to um, uh, describe the, the amount of the problem, uh, Greece now um, has uh, a public deficit of about 164% percent of its gross national um, uh, product. When uh, the Greek debt crisis, so to say, become officially recognized, it had uh, a deficit of 115%, which at that time in 2010 was regarded as being unbearable. Now we have 135%. And if all the austerity measures imposed on Greece uh, will be put into force and if uh, they work according to the plans of the uh, Troika, Greek will have in 2020 or is supposed to have in 2020 again uh, a deficit amounting to 115% of the national gross, uh, national gross product which exactly is that amount which it had in 2010. How can you explain the inefficiency 
uh, of um, the measures uh, applied. Actually, uh, to understand the debt crisis and the methodology in which it works out, you have to understand, understand that public debt actually is a form of redistribution and looting of um, national economies. For example, in 2010, in April, Greece received the last um, loan on capital market to uh, an interest rate of 6.5% for uh, a period of 10 years. Uh, a loan of 6.5% for a period of 10 years means that after 10 years they are supposed hypothetically to refinance almost 95% of the loan uh, which they acquired. That means although having paid 6.5% annually in interest, they were not able to reduce uh, the actual amount of debt, which as such shows that uh, public debt accepted is nothing but uh, a legal means of looting national economies without giving them the possibility to come out of debt trap. And you can, not, uh, you can now refer to the history of all that. You can refer to the fact that uh, the Greek um, economic um, model was based on uh, credit in order to import industrial goods from uh, northern European economies. <coughs> and you can develop, of course, programs which, uh, would, talk, which would aim at the recovery of the Greek economy in terms of making it fit to export again. But all these things are plans which would uh, acquire a period of 10 or 15 days to become uh, effectual. For the moment in which we are in, the most important question regarding uh, the indebted countries is to get in this or that way, get rid of the debt meaning to abolish the debt in order uh, to free the countries from the uh, necessity and from the uh, obligation annually to take, uh, to, um, take uh, a certain um, amount of their gross national product only to serve the interests of uh, those banks and those countries uh, who are uh, the, the holders uh, of the debt. Uh, and all the measures implied now uh, by uh, the European Central Bank, the European uh, Commission uh, and uh, the IMF, which historically for the very first time interferes in uh, uh, European uh, economic uh, problems, have aggravated these economic and social contradictions of states whose competitive uh, position vis-à-vis -vis the export-orientated uh, states uh, still uh, is decreasing. Uh, the ruthless hardship with which the Troika has, has pushed through the austerity dictate over Greece, as well as the treaties of the European Council of last January, the Treaty on Stability, Coordination and Governance, go to show that these austerity measures which now are tested in uh, a couple of peripheral countries of the European Union will be applied all over uh, the territory of the EU. That's why people from Greece, but not only from Greece, also from Central and Eastern Europe, uh, come to us as uh, leftists from Western Europe telling us that what we experience now is that what is in front of you, namely um, a general change in the rule of the social and political system uh, of the European uh, Union. This means that the dismantling of the social and welfare state is not only a problem of a couple of indebted countries, it now becomes to the standard which will be applied and which should be applied according to the decision taking uh, by the European Councils. Uh, to all over the member states um, of the European Union. It is dismantling of the welfare state, it's lowering uh, the level of wages and salary, it's deregulating the labour market, 
according to um, um, a survey which I recently uh, received from the HUE, which is the scientific um, research organization of the European uh, Trade Union uh, Council, from 27 member states of the European Union, already 10 have to decide it, more or less uh, consequence the regulations uh, of the labor market, which means uh, giving the possibility to interfere directly in um, wage uh, negotiations in industrial conflict. One of the directives uh, which is now uh, in debate in the European Union refers directly uh, to uh, or would provide the possibility of the European Court of Justice to interfere in um, industrial conflicts, in labor conflicts within member states of the European Union because they are regarded as in contradiction uh, to the uh, liberty of uh, service uh, providing. And if you put all these together, namely the extended pressure on uh, labor unions in the enterprises, uh, the permanent pressure in order to reduce social budgets, uh, the uh, deregulation of the labor market, this fits perfectly to a picture of what is going on uh, in Europe. Namely, besides the structural crisis, which can be explained by overaccumulation and by imbalances between the uh, European Union countries, which have, so to say, objective economic reasons, you can now say very clearly, see very clearly, that um, using uh, these objective moments of crisis, the elites in the member states and the elites of the European Union have decided to get rid of that was, was what was called during decades the European social model and which on his part is the result and the achievement of a 30-40 years class struggle which took place after Second World War at least in the western part uh, of the European Union. And when I talk about this question I always say uh, that we have to understand this as the historical moment in which we are in. Because there is, at least in Western Europe, an intimate connection between uh, welfare state and democracy. For example, in the United States, you can discuss passionately, but within a democratic political frame if you agree or if you disagree with the idea that 30 or 40 million of US American citizens should be included in the healthcare system. This is that what the American political system allows. In Europe, and this is my proposal, you cannot discuss this question. In case you would agree to destruct and to demolish healthcare pension system, uh, then you risk also the existence of institutional parliament parliamentary democracy, as distorted, as limited, as restricted as it already is. And if you have this in consideration, uh, then you may understand what the political relevance of the authoritarian, nationalist and xenophobic right in Europe is really about. Of course, uh, we as leftists, we oppose uh, their ideas on um, ethnically clean societies, on getting rid of migrants, on not granting them equal access to political participation and, and, and social security. But the strategic question is if the opposition and the anti-elitism which marks the new right in Europe from the very beginning will turn into more than to a simple political gesture in order to mobilize 
in a populist way uh, support, but will become a serious political option for uh, relevant uh, groups of the ruling elites within uh, the European Union and in the most important uh, nation states in the European uh, Union. And here, in a certain way, the circle closes as the answer to the question is linked uh, with the question of the crisis of the European integration, which convers con conversely triggers these increasing nationalisms provoked by the austerity policies and the centralist authoritarian uh, turn of the uh, European Union. If you want to assess, um, let's say, developments uh, of a nearer uh, future, uh, much uh, will depend uh, on which of the competing concepts about the future role of Germany will prevail uh, within its elites and in this respect we must not take anything uh, for granted or to speak out uh, more clearly. The idea of um, a European Germany was yesterday. The prevailing idea which is now followed by Angela Merkel and her government is the idea of a German Euro. But we should not be sure that this is the end of the story. You have in, within the German elites uh, an ongoing debate on if Germany were better off if it were out of the constraints created by the European Union. If you look, for example, into the, the embedding of the German economy in the world economy and in the <coughs> European economy, you find that uh, 40% uh, of Germany, uh, of Germany's exports, are directed to countries of the Eurozone. 40%, this is by large, the biggest uh, portion of, of German exports. But at the same time, it's less than a half. It's less than a half. And secondly, the most dynamic uh, areas of German exports are created by Russia and China. Uh, which shares in German export rates now to 10% and the tendency of it is growing. So I mm -hmm. would not take in any case for granted that the prevailing interest in Germany would be maintaining the Eurozone, keeping the peripheral economies in. Maybe we will see uh, a process in which the Eurozone uh, will decrease. But if you imagine the picture of a decrease of the Eurozone, uh, you have to ask uh, what will be, so to say, the final result of the split of the Eurozone. Of course, Greece, um, Portugal, Spain, and then Italy, and after Italy, the um, economic um, correspondences or or the economic um, situations uh, between uh, Germany and France differ dramatically, actually. And if uh, you had a core European Union consisting of the Northern European <coughs> export-orientated, most performing economies, uh, which includes for political reasons, uh, uh, for example, France, you can not be sure that such a construction would actually be workable. And again, this is not a question of economic relations and uh, of economic imbalances. This is, of course, a question of political considerations and political decisions. And it is not likely that the elites uh, which now lead the European member states uh, of the EU uh, and the European institutions would be prone to such a development. And therefore, the question arises if there are any other elites come up with a different political conception of Europe and with a different, um, let's say, option of how uh, making the uh, political, economic, and national uh, relations on the uh, European continent. And I know you have discussed the question uh, of um, is it 
from a leftist point of view, uh, a good option that um, some countries uh, leave the Eurozone, should the left be uh, uh, supporting the European construction uh, in order uh, to reform the European Union as such? I think these are interesting questions, uh, although I have to admit uh, these are not the questions which I find are in the foreground uh, of, of the real political confrontation. Because the real political confrontation is not about scheduling a model of the European Union. I believe that the uh, real political confrontation has to start from the inside that the, Euro that the European Union as it exists cannot persist. If you want to have a European integration, you have to refound the European Union as such. Meaning, you have to create a structure which is not based on the idea of a single and free market with its liberties and then add somehow uh, social politics to it. And you cannot accept a political construction in which um, democracy is a kind of ornament to a more or less self-reliant uh, uh, market. You have to reverse the question. You have to agree on the political and social finality of European integration. You can then deduce from the political and social targets of European integration, uh, social targets, and define instruments. And I would say, for example, that one of the core instruments would be to agree on that the European Union, of course, has to be a transfer union. You have to redistribute income and wealth between the member states of the European Union and between uh, uh, and between the regions of the European Union. And if you want to have a transfer unity, then of course you have to create a political legitimi legitimacy which, which can do it. So when people come to me uh, and tell me, well, the European Union, we have to defend it uh, because uh, it provided us with peace for five decades. If this was the, an argument, then we would have to defend the uh, refoundation of the Warsaw Pact Treaty because, because it also provided us with 50 years of, uh, of peace. Or if somebody comes and says, well, the European Union, this is humanism, this is Erasmus von Rotterdam, this is democracy in essence, I always get this one, because the, uh, Europe is also Auschwitz, it's the Second World War, mm -hmm. it's the war of 30 years, and so on and so forth. There's no reason to look sentimentally on the European Union. But there are practical reasons, namely the existence of a transnational European capital and transnational European financial markets. And if you want to cope with transnational capital and with transnational financial markets, you have to have a political structure which is capable to do so. And that's why we need European integration. This is my main argument. And uh, all the stuff which uh, ideologically tends to defend the European Union actually diverts the attention of that the left has to develop its own vision of European solidarity. And there are, of course, historical roots and historical tradition, traditions. For example, the uh, big alliances which the left was capable to form during the resistance against Nazi Germany, or the original ideas of Alciero Spinelli, uh, who had in mind to create uh, a, a European integration on the basis of uh, social uh, equality and social solidarity. But having said all this, uh, I still insist on that uh, the main target of the left, and that is what Transform now, now tries to, uh, to promote, is how can we uh, create more efficiency, more e efficiency for uh, the ongoing struggles, and how are we able uh, to create the ongoing social struggle with a deliberate and conscious struggle uh, 
targeting at the uh, change of the balance of power in uh, uh, Europe. And this requires, uh, I would say, uh, a couple of uh, new approaches on the part of the left. Firstly, uh, this is um, what I learned from the uh, struggles within the last couple of months. The trade unions play a decisive role in these struggles. Firstly, because they still are big organizations, but secondly, because that what uh, the elite and the uh, European capitalists try at the moment is to get rid of the trade union movement. That is what the, what the political struggle is about. Even when it comes to de deregulating uh, the labor market, when it comes to generalized uh, precariousness, it's not only about uh, raising the rate of exploitation, it's also about destroying organized labor. And what I find is that, uh, at least in some trade unions, the debate has changed. Formerly, they were very uncritical, even apolitical, uh, towards the European Union. Now they start to get a realist, more realistic attitude and start to understand that they have to oppose this general trend in European policies. This is first. Second, I would say that um, the left in Europe, of course, uh, develop um, a diversity, uh, let's say, in um, social and political spheres in which it interferes. There is a cultural left, there is a social left, there are the social movements, there are the social fora, and there is a political left. And it was unusual that these different forces created common spaces in which they were able to work together. And I think we have to change this. Firstly, we have to change these separations within the di different departments uh, of the left in Europe, since the political attack against the social and welfare state and against the left is a comprehensive political attack, so that requires the combination of the different forces. But secondly, which is uh, the most important consequence which I take from uh, these developments is that it is a political struggle. If you have a European Union in which from 27 member states 23 are governed by conservative coalitions. If you have a, a European Council in which from these 27, 23 belong to conservative parties. And if you have a commission which is to two-thirds composed by conservative politicians, and if this all comes together, then you have a certain relation of power and you cannot expect that even the most um, radical and the broadest uh, social struggles or strike mobilizations uh, will be able to change the course of things. And um, coming from Austria, which is a country which traditionally is uh, very apolitical, even the left is rather apolitical in Austria, I always say to people, well, you have to learn politics. We have to learn politics in a very short time in order to create a new relation of power. We were able in March for the very first time since a long period to create uh, a joint um, public space of experts, of politicians, of artists, of trade unionists, of people from the social movement in which we agreed to create a European, let's say, subjectivity, which would be able to um, complement national struggles by providing them a European perspective and add to the social demands of the struggles, which aim at redistribution, defense of the welfare states, um, overcoming precariousness, all these things which we are 
pretty used to demand from a state which is not our state. But uh, to complement these uh, social struggles with a political perspective which allows us step by step to change the relation of power within the national states and on the European level. Finally, you may ask if it is late, maybe even too late to avoid defeat. However, if we were able to come out of defeat with an enhanced capacity to challenge the elite in the next round depends on our capability now to join in forces and to politize ourselves. And I think this is the main uh, conclusion of the uh, developments in the last couple of years. The situation is difficult, it's dangerous, however there are possibilities to gain a new momentum of the left and that's what Transform is committed to. I thank you for the attention. Questions or comments? Yes. There's no. I mean, I think people are just trying to get some time together to get their, to collect their thoughts. I thought this was a really stimulating discussion, a uh, really stimulating paper. Um, I'll pose a very kind of broad question, which I think has been floating around a lot of the discussions we've been having. Is that? The job of the far left is not to solve the capitalists' crisis for them. You know, if we're socialists, we have a very different idea of how we solve the capitalist crisis, which is revolution, get rid of capitalism. I mean, but we also have to recognize that there's a strategic problem with going out in the streets and saying, right, comrades, the EU screwed, let's have revolution. I mean, that's, that's clearly not going to win anyone any points, right? And so, I, I, obviously, when we discuss solutions to the, to the, the current crisis, we talk about these as transitional demands. Who do we work with? How can we push this forward? How can we offer some kind of solution? While also recognizing that the final goal for most of us is something much broader, something much more all-encompassing and, and that will result in a completely different society, a different set of social relations. And so I was just, I was just wondering what your, what your thoughts are on that strategic question of how we balance those, how the far left balances those sort of, those sort of mm. concerns. Mm -hmm. You want me to react directly or, or let's collect? Are there any other questions? Yeah, sure. Would you like to collect them? Or yeah, yeah, I prefer collect. Okay. Um, I want to ask um, how you see the, the whole, the whole uh, Greek exit um, uh, issue. Well, we were debating this um, the, the, for the past three days. Because the question seems, of course, you of course have stated this is not our state. Uh, ne uh, ne neither were the pre-EU nations, the uh, national states, um, uh, uh, states. Th these were capitalist societies with capitalist states. The capitalist state is, is guaranteeing uh, uh, property relations. It is it is the enforcer um, of, of, uh, of uh, it disciplines uh, um, in, uh, um, labor power. It organizes to some extent the reproduction of labor power. It's 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 uh, it's education and so forth and so forth. But at the same time, of course. Uh, as you have uh, stated uh, yourself, uh, the, the, the capitalist elites of Europe um, are now in, in a historical position where, where the, where the um, post-war welfare state arrangement has become counterproductive uh, from, uh, from the point of view of, of, of capital. That is, it, 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 it is becoming a problem for, for, uh, for profit rates. Um, so they are, of course, tra using this crisis, obviously, um, to accelerate in that direction. Um, and part of the EU architecture um, uh, was, was meant to bypass those institutions with, uh, existing at the nation state level, which, uh, which uh, institutionalized certain forms of, well, not class compromise, because uh, it, it, people usually talk about the class compromise, but it's no compromise if uh, only one class compromises. I mean, the capitalists didn't really compromise in the Keynesian period because the profit rates were high enough for them, I mean, uh, from that perspective. But uh, so. Um, um, so when we talk about building a, a, a different Europe, uh, I don't see. I don't see it. Um, it's not. Um, uh, I don't think there is a separate. Uh, well, at least for the left, there is no separate European level. 
uh, it can only be an articulation of, 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 of local struggles and uh, using the framework of the existing nation states, which are still here, they never went away. They are still the repressive apparatuses of every nation state in Europe are, are still here. It is the left arm of the state that is withdrawing and the right arm is feeling hard because uh, to, to ensure the reproduction of capitalist relations. So um, the question would be then, um, the danger also, I think part of the danger of the rising of the populist uh, uh, right is if the left uh, is too focused on the European project because it's, in, it's post-national, allegedly, but the you know, American relations show basically that it, it, it isn't. The Germans refuse Euro bonds, so they, they, uh, what they are saying to the rest of Europe is we insist that, the, the, that these are separate national economies competing uh, against each other and pushing the working classes of all of these nations in competition with each other. And if the, rest, uh, if the left ignores these, these things, well then uh, uh, nationalist narratives of, of a right-wing populist kind uh, uh, tend to gain possibility. Because if you have, if you have a social Darwinist uh, uh, race, again, with, uh, between national economies, nationalism tends to become a plausible framework of thinking, even for, for, for the labor movements, because they are pushed in a position uh, of, of, of an immediate uh, alliance with their national capitals, and so on and so on. So if that is the case, what for, uh, um, uh, well, the, the Western European left is to a certain extent um, in, a, in a better, uh, in a relatively privileged position because it is, uh, the social destitution has not reached uh, uh, a Greek left. But for the, uh, the Greeks need immediate uh, access. Uh, for them, I mean, uh, what, what, uh, you, you cannot um, tell um, the Greek population, the Greek left cannot say, well, let's wait four or five years until we solve it at, at the European level. In the meantime, you can have um, you know, uh, there is a so, so social catastrophe and, and, and the danger of, of a, of a, a right-wing resurgence of, of the neo-fascist kind which you've described. Um, I would like to ask you uh, if you think that the, uh, if uh, the existing um, institutional framework of the European Union is useful uh, for the, I don't know, let's say, constructing of some, some uh, um, kind of European socialism, or what institutional reforms would you propose uh, that the left could use the uh, existing institutions in uh, constructing uh, socialist Europe? Any more questions? Yeah. Well, firstly, yeah, regarding regarding uh, uh, Greece, um, I, I I take uh, Lapavitsa's argument very serious because what he actually says is, it is economically touristical feasible that we exit the euro. Uh, but then he not but and then he says and when we have exited the euro then we have to negotiate <laughs> with the European Union how to go on and uh, his intellectual experiment as an economist is relevant and important because it shows there are different options but politically I ask myself what is the difference if you be in the European Union and you, you have to negotiate about the debt, you have to negotiate politically. And the outcome will be defined by the relation of power. And if you exit the European Union, you have to negotiate politically. And the outcome will again be defined by the relation of power. So that's why, uh, as an economist, I find his research interesting. As a politician, I say, well, if I was um, the Prime Minister of Greece, I would take uh, Lapavitsa's research and go to the European Central Bank and say to them, well, look, we have alternatives. But this is not the point of view which I share, because I ask myself, what can the left in Europe do in order to express or, or to be practical with its solidarity. And I think what we have to do is, firstly, we have to advocate the idea of the abolishment of the debt. If the debt continues, in the best case, it will be the continuation of a permanent 
development to the worst in Greece. And in the worst case, in the case of a disorderly default, it will, will lead to a falling apart, not of the institutions as such, but also of the everyday uh, relations of people which are somehow mediated by financial transactions. So uh, what we have to do is to exercise the hardest possible pressure on governments in order to accept the devaluation, and this is the core of the problem, it's not the Greek default, it's the devaluation of the speculative capital which is invested in Greece. And this is also at stake in the crisis, namely the, default, uh, the, the, the devaluation of a large part of the capital. Then, of course, this implies a couple, uh, not a couple, a series <coughs> of, uh, of um, political and even technical aspects. For example, the fact, uh, we have to consider the fact that 50% or since then more of uh, the sovereign debt of Greece now is held by the European Central Bank, which would mean if the debt is simply abolished, it would lead to nothing else but that European <laughs> taxpayers would pay for the Greek debt which I would even say it's preferable to the continuation of the situation as it is. But for the left it's important to connect this question of the abolition of the debt with a question of a restructuring of the European financial sector, namely changing the role of the European Central Bank, uh, nationali nationalizing the big banks, separating the, the um, investment from the saving function uh, of the banks and so on and so forth, um, which, which uh, would firstly make sense but, but also would uh, allow us to explain to people in the rich countries, so to say, so-called rich countries, of the favored countries, privileged countries of the European Union, that the, the, the left is not defending um, the Greek nation, but is defending the, weak, the, the, the Greek working class, and at the same time is defending the working class in our countries, which we have to do when we want to fight uh, nationalism. So this, uh, and uh, <coughs> There are now a couple of, uh, of, uh, of international calls which are supported uh, and propagated by Transform. One uh, important call of Greek intellectuals, uh, one very important call of uh, German um, uh, scientists and German trade unionists who for the very first time accept the argument that Germany is the problem and not Greece is the problem in Europe and that requires a change in, in, in German politics, even in wage politics. That's why it was good that Verdi uh, was demanding uh, a wage increase of 6.5%, because the low wage, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the results in, in, in the insufficient wage development in Germany is one of the, one of the, the, the economic uh, mess. Uh, and at the same time, uh, I say this, uh, not I say this, but I say it because I hear it from my Greek comrades who remind the Europeans always it's not about defending the Greeks. It's defending the Greek working class, which makes a difference because 330 billion of euro from Greek capital are now abroad. How can the European Union make sure that these 300 uh, billion euro go back to Greece? And can then um, be uh, used to improve the, uh, the, the living conditions. So, um, to put it in a nutshell, I think the criterion of left politics at the moment is to look at all these things from a class-based perspective, <coughs> and not in a, in a dogmatic way, but explaining, showing, demonstrating that that what's going on in uh, Europe is a huge 
offensive against the working class, its achievements and, and, and its uh, organizations. And the counter interpretation, the narrative of the left has to be this one. It's not about nation, it's about class and it's uh, not about race, it's about democracy. And if we were able to develop this narrative systematically, as we were partially able, by the way, in the French elections, which then was not so visible because the, uh, Marine Le Pen uh, gained uh, votes from the traditional left. But for the very first time, uh, the, the left front and the left parties were able in the outskirts, in the, in the banlieue, to have big meetings. And Mélenchon, by the way, was not in the slightest way prone to make concessions to racism. The always was saying, well, <laughs> uh, the republic comes from the people and the nation comes from the republic and that's why where here this belongs to the nation and has to acquire the same rights regardless if he or she was born there or there or there. And this narrative works. It works when it's not only based on the nice and positive idea of human solidarity, but when it is based on class, on the understanding that it's a fight between top and bottom in society, and when it's also linked with the traditions of class struggle in a, in a certain, in a certain uh, space. <coughs> That's why I personally and transform as a network tries now to promote this idea we have to look at things from a class-based perspective. Regarding the European uh, construction, well, what is the European Union? Firstly, it's a misunderstanding between the populations and the European Union as such. You go to Brussels, you see these huge buildings, you see thousands of thousands of officials, but very few people are aware that the number of officials of the European Union is less than the officials of the Viennese municipality. Then the people from the European Parliament, they regard themselves as very important persons and go from commission to commission and vote and blah, 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 blah. A matter of fact, they govern 1.15% of the gross national product of the European Union. Nothing. Not nothing, but almost nothing. If European integration would be meant and taken seriously, of course they would have to govern 10%, 15%, because you have to redistribute income and wealth. If the European Union, uh, as by the way, Friedrich Hayek proposed, would disappear suddenly, what would be remaining? Remaining would be a system of treaties which allows the free flow of goods, of services, of capital um, and of people. And this would be much more worse than what we have now, because what we have now it is, is at least the broken promise that this free flow of good services, money and people would somehow democratically regulated. The only thing which is regulated in the European Union is the flow of people, by the way. <coughs> but the flow of capital? But it's necessary. And you cannot go back to the year 1955 by saying, well, we recreate the system of taxes in Europe, or uh, uh, we reintroduce border controls in order to make sure that um, uh, goods are not smuggled in. This, would, uh, this led between the wars to uh, nationalist contradictions. What now is required to accompany this free flow of goods and services by a deliberate policy of regulation and redistribution of income and wealth. And I would say this is somehow what you uh, described as a transitional idea. What we have to do is 
um, to defend people from crisis, not say capitalism, but defend people. And if people still believe that it has to be done within a money economy, then we should book up with this idea and try to use this idea to formulate alternatives which not simply manage capitalism which, but target at changing the relation of power within capitalism and raising people's awareness that whatever you acquire you have to fight for. And historically this is the moment uh, I agreed to almost everything what you were saying but there was a formula uh, to which uh, I want to say a word. I do not believe that it is due to uh, the, 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 the necessities uh, triggered by the fall of the profit rate why they uh, want to get rid of, of the welfare state. They never wanted the welfare state. They accepted it and in this sense it was actually a compromise between the classes. Only the social democrats believed that the welfare state was an aim as such. Actually, um, it was a compromise between the idea of the labor movement, we want to have anti-capitalist, post-capitalist societies, um, and the capitalists who said, well, we can make life better within capitalist frame, and that's what they wanted to demonstrate, that is. Since the relation of power has changed, and it has changed in the factories due to uh, tech technological uh, developments and innovations due to social structural changes. It has changed in the international arena. You may have liked the Soviet Union and the socialist camp or not, but it was part of uh, a certain relation of power. And then they saw the window of opportunity to get rid of all this. And differently to the situation um, after World War Two, when there was actually a space in which you could negotiate how far social progress could go, this space does not exist because the counterpart says, well, look, the markets, I mean that the financial markets, 25 banks are involved in, 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 in tendering uh, when, a, when a state um, uh, demands for loans. 25 banks. <coughs> the repo market, you know, this is the, the market in which securities um, are traded with regard to public debt, uh, is a website of, um, a closed website of 400 uh, entities which take part. This is a very small group of people who actually are the financial markets. And they in respect of the relation of power given, see now the opportunity to get rid of all of this. And that's why we have to explain people, if you want to defend welfare state, you have to mobilize. If you want to achieve results uh, in the welfare state, you have to change the relation of power. And if you want to change the relation of power within the national state, you have to create a relation of power on the European scale. Not because we believe so much in it, but because it's a reality. It makes a difference if you had a, a European institution which somehow, like the European Central Bank, is commissioned, let's say, to punish states when they don't reach uh, a certain rate of employment. And again, it would then be a question of the relation of power, but it makes a difference, and this is what, what Europe is about. And the last remark which I want to make with regard of all these questions, national, uh, international, I mean, in the European uh, scale, you can say that the European left of the left represents about 5% of the electorate and it may now increase, I increase, not increase, in or, or, 
although it will increase in Greece, <laughs> but uh, it may increase on the European scale um, in the, um, uh, uh, due to um, elections um, in the forthcoming month. But uh, we are not in the position to exercise now real effective <coughs> power, and that's why we have to ask in which way we interfere in, in discourses. And I prefer in discourses to interfere in discourses by saying European populations, European workers should unite as they are united somehow in a political space. And um, this is a message, so that this is a question of the narrative. This is a question of the philosophy. I mean, between 1939 and, and 1945, the left uh, adopted the narrative we have to defend our nation in front of the Nazi fascist war machine. Yes, but now we have to defend um, uh, the idea that uh, European populations, and in particular, uh, European laborers are not divided by uh, uh, national borders, but are an international political force with common international political aims. And this requires, um, evidently, a European political perspective. I mean, it, it's a discussion that will go on. I, no, it's, it's fine. I mean, your final point about about the national independence, partly continuing, I think, from Stipe's point, I mean, this is a solution that essentially says to the Greek working class, we have to wait until the German working class breaks with the existing system there and starts fighting for I agree with you. I agree with you when you say that the working class internationally has common interests. Of course they do. I mean, working class in... The working class in core imperialist countries have never really benefited from imperialism. You've benefited from a stronger capitalist state. It's strength in the hand of the capitalists. I mean, you, you, we've always had this position, but that's not to say that the working class in a core country is, it has the same level of power as the working class in a, in a peripheral country. I mean, the situation here, the, the, problem with, the problem with this sort of vision of the European Union, I think, and to insist on this having to be resolved at a European level, and particularly to say this is not a national issue. I think I agree with you when our role is not to is not to prioritize a nationalist argument to defend the Greek working class as Greeks, but it, but it's to recognize that the national question is built into the European Union. It's built and it's coming out very clearly right now in the Greek crisis. I mean, uh, uh, so in that sense, the question is not I think, and some of the, one of the things we've been talking about here the past few days is not simply is to try to get over this this dichotomy, which is a false dichotomy to say either the European Union and we have to wait. The Greek working class has to wait for the stronger working classes in France, Germany, Austria, the, the, the Scandinavian countries, etc., to start taking up the fight on their behalf. And I, I agree with you about, about raising the demand of, of drop the debt. I think that's a very practical demand and something we used in the 80s regarding Africa, regarding Latin America. I think we can revive that again in a European context. But, but nor is the other option just to fall back on the nation state. I mean, the third option would be to go back to a long tradition of socialist thought in the Balkans and in Eastern Europe as well, to think about federative ideas. How can we shift those power relations between the core and the periphery through some kind of local federative, federative project? And so I think in some ways, uh, the idea that Europe is a solution, Europe may be a solution in the long term, some kind of you know, new socialist Europe would be, would be a solution, but at the same time, that, that has to happen. There has to be an immediate solution for Greece, and I don't think that, that waiting for the stronger working classes of, of Western and Central Europe is, is an answer in that case. No, definitely not. I mean, maybe this, this debate is, is really based on a misunderstanding, because I agree um, uh, with, uh, even with that idea uh, raised by Lapovitsis. If there is no European solidarity, uh, what should the Greeks do then? The question is, uh, if, if, if the Greek population decided, for example, to exit the euro, I would say it is the, 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 the utmost duty uh, and task of the European left to strengthen the solidarity with them. This is, not, this is really not the point, and it cannot be the point, as we don't know what will be uh, half a year later. <coughs> this is really, this is not the, not the difference, uh, because I think uh, for example, the European Left Party. If 
the Greeks left the Euro, I would not separate myself from my Greek comrades. Of course not. Of course not. Nobody would think that way. And if they decided to do so, that this is the best and the most plausible solution for them, I would accept it, although I have doubts as an economist and as a, as a politician. And never, never, ever, you must say, that the Greeks have to wait until the Germans uh, stop to be Germans. The, 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 the point is, we have to develop a message which we can, at the same time, direct towards the Greeks and towards the Germans, at least to show to the Greek population there is a force. Yes, there is the European left. We fight for you. We fight for you in Athens and we fight for you in Berlin. This is, and if you look at this, and this is what I understand, um, um, what class-wise thinking is about. This is my interpretation of class-wise thinking, namely to, to be capable to show the, the, the common the common denominator of something, then you can then you can operate with different developments and we should be prepared for different developments. There will be no smooth development in, in, in Europe. And uh, I mean and, and the problem of the Greek left by the way is not that they are so much divided divided about the question whether or not to exit from the Euro. They are divided because the Stalinist KKE believes that it must not cooperate with any other left forces and the democratic left believe that it has to uh, create an alliance uh, with the PASOK in order to manage things and then you have our very nice uh, left in the middle of both of them and being accused from both parts as not being consequent but I think that what they do is very realistically namely to say to them uh, we have together in the polls about 30%. If we were able to unite our forces, then we may have 45%. We would be the strongest force. That would be a, a, a shift in the relation of ours. Let's try to do that. And what then comes out, orderly default, renegotiation, unilateral uh, moratorium, whatever they decide should be, should be supported by, by the European level. But what I, with what I, with what I disagree is um, to create a picture uh, in, uh, and this is no, to create a, a picture of this style. Well, the Greeks decide to exit. This is the best solution. It is not because you will see very strange alliances if this came up. Um, the Portuguese decide to leave. The Spaniards decide to leave. If we do this then the northern European countries remain with Germany alone. And this would then be core Europe. This would be the option which the most reactionary forces in Germany advocate. And to be very frank, I'm European, but I'm also Austrian. And I would not like to wake up in the morning as a German citizen. <laughs> Can you then skip this? <laughs> understanding. Okay, this is it again. Okay, one more question. In case that happens, in case we have this poor Europe and this southern Europe, uh, what would this uh, nor for Europe, in your opinion, look like? What political situation would develop? It would be aggressive in military terms. It would be cultural xenophobic. It would be authoritarian. It would be that, but they would still elect in parliaments. No question about this. Um, uh, it would be. This is the economic. The react and political reactionary option for Europe, and the tragic of the German policy, in my opinion, is is that uh, Angela Merkel, she is conservative, but she is for a German Euro, but she is not for for a German uh, for for German policy, which which would be completely unimpeded. Maybe this has. 
even to do with her East German socialization. But she is under the pressure, she is under the pressure of these uh, most reactionary forces. You can name uh, Olaf Henkel, the former um, um, president of the Association of the German Industrialists, or Hans Werner Sinn, who is a Munich-based economist, who advocate most aggressively that uh, it is against the German Grundgesetz that Germany is part of a monetary union which contains even the risk that German money could be used to uh, pay a uh, foreign debt. So that's why they say either we go out or they go out. But that would, I think this would be a disastrous regression in, in, in European politics. This would be the regression to, uh, uh, let's say, a, a structure of uh, state relations in Europe quite similar to that between the two worlds.